Okay, let's get started. So first thing is the midterm, right? The grades is, are posted on Canvas. So uh, go take a look if you haven't. Uh, the you know, class generally did pretty well, right? pretty well in the midterm. Uh, there are some very low scores. So I don't think they're here in the class, but you know, if the people watch the recording, uh, if your grade is in the a low, then uh, you will want to get in, in touch with me. Right? Uh, otherwise, the, uh, so again, the final will be of a very similar format to the midterm. Right? So it'll be you know, covering whatever happened after the midterm until uh, what we finish next week. Okay? So that will be the final. So any questions or thoughts on that? Would it be the same format as well, where it'll be open for the full day? Yes, yes, it'll be the same. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, so it'll be the same. We'll be in an open book and uh, uh, be a one day long exam. Okay. okay, all right. So, yeah, so I intend to use the Schedule final time as say office hours. So that'll be, uh, I think also 2.30 to 4.20 on Tuesday, right? June 8th, I think, that, I think that's the time. So if you cannot make that time, right? If you have another exam that's happening at the exact same time, then let me know. But otherwise we'll use that as a office hour to answer questions. All right, okay, so I think, so we have, a, right, so Monday, next Monday is holiday, so we have two more classes to go. And right, so this class will cover transformers. The next class will cover, uh, we'll finish with induction machines. Okay. So transformers, as we talked about, you know, started talking about last time, is that uh, it's basically a device that uh, changes voltage levels. Right? That is, so you have you know, high voltage or low voltage in one side of it, it can step up or step down the voltage. Okay. So you can do this because two reasons. One, the voltage is AC. And the transformer only works for AC voltage. And the second reason is that uh, power is concerned. So the transformer is really not generating any power. Right? It's simply stepping up and down the voltage. So because, Power is conserved. When it steps down voltage, the current will go up. When it steps up voltage, then the current will go down. Right? So it's not, so again, the thing to remember is the basic equation we have for transformers is just that uh, it preserves power, it preserves power. So the idea, you know, making a transformer is quite straightforward. At the, Basically, you take ion core. Okay. You take a ion core, and what you do is you wrap wires on two sides of it. Okay. So that, that's a transformer. So these are insulated wires. Okay. Right. So the construction of transformer was known, I think, since the mid 1800s. Right. So for a while, people know this is a way that uh, you can shift voltage from both sides. Okay. And uh, so this is a, a more modern transformer, a sort of slightly modern transformer, is, and this is drawing 3D. As you can think of the core as a sort of this hollow brick type of thing. And uh, this core is right now, this is not one piece of iron. It's basically a sort of laminated iron core that uh, keeps the losses low in the transformer, but it's still a core with wires wrapped around two sides. And the principle operation for a transformer is basically saying that uh, if you put a varying field into the a metal core, right, this creates a field and have wires under, you know, have some wires on the other side they will feel this field and generate a voltage. Okay, so that's, that's all it is for operation. Uh, so if you put in, 
So if you think about this, basically, as let's say E1, let's say E1 is an AC voltage. Okay, so let's say we have a synchronous generator and the generator voltage, some voltage E1. Right. So, and this is the AC voltage, so it's time varying voltage. Then if you put this time varying voltage, right? So you, you draw, you have a wire that carries current around it. Then what happens inside of this metal core? If you put in some time varying, uh, right? So you have electric field, that's time varying basically. And you, you have this sort of coils of wires, you have current, AC current flowing. And what happens in the core? So what does that induce? A magnetic field? Right, this induces a magnetic field. Right? So this creates a flux in the core. Right? So the, this creates some flux in the core. Let's say flux goes this way, right? So this is some magnetic flux will happen in the core because I have a I have AC voltage, right? So anybody knows the equation relating this flux to the voltage? I don't remember that. Faraday's law, basically. So how do we relate E1, let's say, to the to this flux? So how does it depend on the number of wires, let's say, or, or the number of times I want around this arm? So N1 is number of windings I have. So how does it, how, what impact does N1 have? So for a, if N1 is a larger, is that uh, smaller or larger, the flux? Larger, because you essentially have like more current going through the core, the like center of the core. Uh, not quite, no. Right, so Faraday's law is your voltage as the N1, the number one in the current times the time derivative of the flux. Okay, so that, that's the Faraday's law is if you create a flux, this is your time derivative. So what we have is you can move this over an integrated loop, right? So this flux is one over N1, E1 dt. That's basically is my flux. So you think of you have a sinusoid, and then for the sinusoid, you can integrate sinusoid, it's still a sinusoid. So this is a flux we have. Then on the other side, right, we have the, we basically have the same equation. Of E2 equals to N2 d phi dt. Okay? But then the operating principle is the flux is the same on both sides, right? Both sides is the same flux. There's a this sort of continuous flux that happens in the core. Okay? So the way you convert voltage is the flux are the same, but one is scaled by N1, one is scaled by N2. So that's how you change voltage, right? So uh, as a, right now, let's assume as an ideal transform. But ideal transform is for now, we'll not worry about the losses you have. So of course we have magnetic field in a core. The core is not a perfect conductor, right? It's not a superconductor. So you have current flow in the core itself and this current flow will create some losses. So we're not, we're gonna, oh, Ignore all of that. We're gonna assume that all the flux goes through the coils. We don't have leakage. So let's just assume this is a perfect uh, magnetic material beside this core, right? So that's also the reason we use iron core, right? We assume the permeability of the material is basically infinite. Okay? So, but when you make this assumptions, the equations work out quite nicely, right? These equations work out quite nicely. What we have is we have E1, this is proportional, right, to N1 times d phi dt. E2 is N2 times d phi dt. 
But then it's the same flux, right? So this is constant in the core. This is uh, the same. We have the same flux in the core. So their time derivative are equal to each other. So the voltages are has a ratio of n1 over n2. Right? This is the ratio they have. So we can say, so this is a time domain signal, right? This are the time domain. So in RMS terms, right, we can look at RMS. The same equation holds, you have u1 over u2 as n1 over n2. So the voltage ratio, right? The voltage ratio is determined by this number called turns ratio. So this is the turns ratio we have. This this n1 over n2 called turns ratio, and the the ratio of the voltage is equal to the turns ratio. And then their E1 and E2 are in phase. There's no phase shift. Okay. So the, because they, they have the same flux in the core, then the ratio of voltage is the ratio of number of windings you have on each side. And one thing to remember is this does not change phase. Okay. So the, volt, the phase doesn't change. Any question with this? Does the frequency also stay the same? Frequency also stays the same, right? There's nothing that will change the frequency or the phase in this. Right, so this transformer, and uh, this is basically the reason we use AC power. We use, uh, our grid is AC, because it's very easy to make this. Right? So transformers are, you know, compared to other things, it's relatively easy to make. You can make some pretty high power transformers. Right? You can, uh, an operating principle is quite simple. And the reason this only works for AC is you have this time derivative term. Okay? So in order to create this magnetic field and for the time derivative to, to, to be not zero, you have to have a time varying voltage. Right? So that's why, DC wouldn't work. You put DC current on both sides, nothing will happen. And again, the, the reason we want sinusoids is that if you take a derivative of a sinusoid of sine or cosine, it's still sine or cosine at the same frequency. And so if you put in a, let's say something like a square wave will be not as nice, right? So sinusoid really you know, makes this transformer the transformer is really sort of, you can think of Taylor design to be for AC waveforms. Right? So if for AC pass signals, you have transformer, all it does is changes the voltage. Right? Steps up or steps down the voltage, depending on the ratio. Questions? Um, so it's only good with the sinusoid, right? If, the, if, it, if it's square wave, then it's not working at all. No, no, so square wave will work. It is more complicated, right? So the time of derivative of square wave is not zero. So you still have a field, right? You still have a flux. And this flux still, uh, you, know, you have a square wave, this is still have a flux. This equation is still true. It's just that the output is a little bit more, sort of the, the time derivative becomes more complicated. But basically you need something where the derivative is not zero. So DC doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is the voltage relationship. Then if you look at current, right? Then it's pretty easy to get what current is because uh, power is conserved on both sides. Right? So we know that S1 equals to S2 on both sides. Right? The complex power is conserved, there's no power loss. So if E1 over E2 is N1 over N2, then what's I1 over I2? If the power stays the same. Wait, the voltage for both 
are the same, right? So, so wouldn't the currents be the same? No, think about it, right? So if the power stays the same and the voltage is transformed through this ratio, then what is the ratio of the current? Right, so power stays the same means what? E1, I1 star equal to E2, I2 star, right? So if E1 over E2 is M1 over N2, what's I1 over I2? The reciprocal of that? Reciprocal, right? So it's a product as a one, right? They have to multiply out to be one. So this is N2 over N1. So you, because, right, so this, this equation is the same as E1 over E2, I1 over I2 equals to one. So there must be reciprocal, right? The ratio must be reciprocal, okay? So again, no phase change. But the current, uh, the ratio of the current is the opposite or the reciprocal of the ratio of the voltage. Okay, any questions for this? Okay. So this so th this basic equation allows us to do a lot of simple calculation. A lot of calculation will simplify because of this. Right. So the reason is we want to have an equivalent circuit for a transformer. Right? When we draw a circuit, we don't want to draw a transformer in between. It. And deal with this all the sort of voltage ratios and uh, you know current ratio and things like that. We want to look at this. Right? We want basically to summarize this into a simpler circuit where we don't have to draw a and we don't have to draw a transformer in between. Okay, so that's guys a little bit uh, uh, too troublesome, right? To to draw a transformer for everywhere. Okay, so on this to a simpler circuit. And the way we look, we do a simpler circuit it asks the following question. Suppose you stand at E1, okay? and you look inside, okay? When you look inside, from E1's perspective, what is the load you will see from this perspective? Okay, so this is some load. So we're gonna call this the load prime, right? So the actual load is something will attach to the secondary side, right? To the secondary. So let's, uh, let me be clear about terminology. So the source side is called the primary and the low side is called a secondary. And we always draw the circuit from left to, most of the time we'll draw a transformer from left to right. So the left-hand side is the primary, that's where we think of as the input. The right-hand side is the secondary, we'll think that as an output. Okay? So we're gonna stand at the primary voltage, look into the circuit and see what is the equivalent resistance we see, what is the equivalent impedance we see from the primary side, okay. right? So if we can compute this, equi this equivalent impedance, then we don't have to, uh, again, worry about this transformer, okay? We can directly work with a simpler circuit, okay? So that's why this is called a reflected impedance. Basically, we want a way to bring this impedance load somehow to bring it forward to the primary side. I right? want to see what is the load looks like if you look from the primary side. And this is, that boils down to computing this number. Okay. We need to compute this ratio to find the equivalent impedance from the primary side. And this equivalent, so let's think about how do we find this, right? So how do we find this equivalent impedance? So we know that the load, right, appearing from this side as the prime, the actual load is E2 over I2. 
So let's look at the ratio of this. Let's look at the ratio. Let's look at this ratio. This is E1 over I1, E2 over I2. Right? This is what we have. So this is E1. So I can break up the fraction into the following form. Okay? I can do this. And then I have N1 over N2 for the first ratio. Also N1 over N2 for the second ratio. So recall, E1 over E2 is N1 over N2, I1 over I2 is N2 over N1. Okay. So I2 over I1 is also N1 over N2, this is N1 over N2 squared. So my impedance, uh, the reflected impedance on the primary side, this is the prime value, is N1 over N2 squared, times to the actual impedance value, Z low. So this is what the, a transformer looks like from the primary side, okay? So if you, you have a transformer, it's as if moving the load in front, right? Moving the load from the secondary to the primary scale by this number N1 over N2 squared. Any questions with this calculation? So this is actually sort of the basic equation for a, at least a single phase transformer, right? Because this calculation, you can, with this calculation, you can completely eliminate this transformer from the picture, right? So if you can do this computation, you don't need to worry about the transformer anymore. And uh, this low, you can just pretend there's no transformer, but you change the load value by a factor of N1 over N2 squared. Okay? So that's it, right? So this is also a case where, you know, so basically if you have all these components, the power is conserved on both sides, but the impedance is definitely not conserved on both sides, right? So on the midterm, if some of you lost marks, you lost marks basically for a DC converter, you move the load to one side, right? That is not conserved, right? So the thing that's conserved is power. And all of this are this this n one over n two square number is basically a consequence of the power being the same on both sides. Okay. And uh, so the summary summarizing uh, there are basically just three equations for a transformer: the voltage ratio, the current ratio, and the fact that the impedance gets reflected to the primary side. All right, so this is the transformer we have. So if you look at the transformer, what happens is in practice, nobody bothers to count the number of wires on each side, right? We, we don't count you know, the exact number on one, the exact number on two. So in practice, when you look at a transformer, you basically get three numbers like this. Okay, so this is called the ratings of a transformer. And this is how we encode information about the transformer through these ratings. Okay. So the rating of the transformer has three numbers. The first number is apparent power. Okay. So this is the power, the amount of apparent power you can send through your transformer is apparent power. The second two numbers, uh, this is the primary voltage. And this is the secondary voltage. Okay, so that's what the rating means. As so this is our two voltage levels the transformer should operate at. So this means that N1 over N2 is 120 over 240 is one half. So what uh, this kind of Ratings give you the turns ratio, right? You can compute the turns ratio if you know the voltage rating. 
This also gives you the value that the transformer should be operated. Okay, so rate transformer rated at 120 to 40. We need to make sure the voltage on both sides are fairly close to the rated voltage. Okay, so if it's rated at 120, this will probably work for some any number between let's say you know 110 and 130. But let's say if your input is you know 10 volts, there's no guarantee of this transformer working. Okay, so when you use a transformer, you have to make sure uh, the rating makes sense for your application. Okay. So that's why it's given this way, right? You want to know the power and the voltage ratings, and from the voltage ratings, you can compute the turns ratio. Okay. So the rated voltage just means that uh, you don't damage the transformer right? if you offer it at this voltage. And you don't want, for example, break down the insulation, uh, cause fire or something like that. So you have a rated voltage. Rated current means that you know you cannot put too much power across the transformer, right? You don't want to, for example, melt your wire or have you know uh, too high of a temperature. So the ratings are important. Right? So you, you figure out what, for different applications or different ratings for the transformer. So this is you know typically a household transformer. Any questions about this? And uh, for a transformer, so primary and secondary, and then you should think of that as a way to identify which side you're connecting to. Although there's nothing magical about one side being primary, one side being secondary. Right, so for this transformer, for example, 2KVA, 120, 240, you can just flip the primary and secondary around. You can operate as a 2K, 2KVA, 240, 120. Okay, so there's nothing magical about it. We use the word primary and secondary to you know, basically to denote in our mind which side is the input, which side is the output, or you know, which side is the source, which side is the load. But from a transformer's perspective, it's entirely symmetrical. You can flip the whole thing okay, as a transformer. All right, so this is our this is the transformer rating. And normally the current rating is not given. But we can compute the current rating easily, right? We can compute the rated current pretty easily from the rated power and the rated voltage. So let's say this is our transformer given to us. Let's say we want, let's compute the rated current. Yeah, let's compute the rated current. So remember that the complex power is V1 times I1 star. So since we don't know the phase, right? So here we don't know the angle information. So normally the computation we do is the absolute value, the magnitude is the magnitude of the voltage times the magnitude of the current. So for example, the rating on the primary side is S over V1, this is 2kVA. Over 240 volts, this is 8.33 amps. I2, the rate on the secondary side, 2kVA, 120, this is 16.66 amps. Okay, so these are the current ratings of the transformer. Any questions about the single phase transformer? Okay, so they are relatively simple objects, like at least from a circuit perspective. From a circuit perspective. Uh, anytime basically you see a load, you see a, some load, you can just bring it up in front into the primary side by multiplying by this ratio of normal and two square. So, Nowadays, of course, you can get a little bit more fancy, right? You get a little bit fancier than a straightforward transformer. What we have is we have something called a tap changing transformer. Okay? And what this tap changing transformer does is saying that, you know, I don't, I may want a variable 
secondary voltage. Right? I may want my secondary voltage to be variable. So instead of fixing the turns ratio, instead of I have many tabs, each of them corresponding to a different turns ratio, and I can change the tabs. I can change the tabs. And the once I change a tab, I can have different secondary uh, voltages, right? So this is, you can have a variable V2, right? So V2 is not fixed, right? For some given V1, I can have a variable V2, and uh, this will give me more flexibility on the secondary voltage. So can you think of some situation why we want, why we want a tab changing transformer? Any ideas on why we want a, you know, when we want to change the turns ratio? Or in worse circumstances, we want to change the turns ratio? If we have a changing load. Right. So if you have a changing load, then what happens to the voltage? So let's say you have a transformer, right? And this side, you have a changing load. Then as the load increases, what happened to your voltage appearing across the load? That's the load demands as a bigger resistance. So if I increase the load, let's say, you know, uh, we have electric vehicles and I plug a lot of them in, and start charging. Does your voltage go down or go up for increasing load, for a larger load? Going down. Uh, the voltage goes up? The voltage has to go down, right? The voltage cannot go up. Right? So the voltage will go I down. The the load. Sorry? I thought you mean the voltage different in the load. Yeah, so this is your voltage, right? So we're, we're looking at this voltage. And if the load increases, the voltage goes down. Right? So the, the, that's sort of the, uh, you have more load, you just have a lower voltage up here and cause it. So then what happens is because the voltage depends on the load. If you have a heavier load, you want to boost your voltage. So you basically have more turns ratio, but right? you change the number of turns on your ratio. And uh, so you change the number of turns ratios on the secondary, depending on the load you have, depending on exactly what the load is, to make sure that you know, a constant voltage always appear across the load. Right? You want to make sure this appears, this always appears a constant. You have you know, uh, the load, even though the value of the load changes, the amount of power demands changes, you want a constant voltage to appear across it. Right. So and uh, now, so today this works. So in all distribution systems, it's very common to have tap changing transformers, and these transformers today are basically coded to uh, time of the day, right? Because we know when people leave home, so the load reduces. We know when people comes back, the load increases. So the tabs are changed corresponding to that, corresponding to the time of day usage pattern. And uh, these loads are changed, you know, these things are changed a uh, few times a day, right? Two, three times a day. And the challenge nowadays is you know, if you have, let's say, renewables, where you have much faster changes, and then the problem is that if you, because this is a mechanical device, if you switch this very often, let's say you switch this thing you know, every few minutes. So what happens if I switch this very often? So what happens if I, instead of switching you know, every five hours, I start switching every five minutes? You eventually could run into reliability issues. All right, so you're running to reliability or lifetime issues. Right? So all of these, so all of these things are basically designed to have X number of switches. 
right? They will switch X number of times in their lifetime. Right? So, you know, these things have a lifetime of, let's say 20, 30 years also, 20, 20 30 years or so. Right? But then they're designed 20, 30 years with a, you know, thinking about switching two, three times a day. So now if you're gonna switch, uh, let's say a hundred times a day, instead of 20 years, suddenly you're looking at, you know, two years or a year and a half, right? So you're gonna degree the lifetime of these devices. And that's something we want to avoid. But our transformers are already old. Right? We have very old transformers in the system. You know, some 40 years old trans. The average lifetime of our transformers are about 40, 40 50 years. Right? So you want to avoid degrading them even faster. And so that's why today you see a lot of power electronics sort of complementing those tap changing transformers. Because you cannot switch this thing very often. But what you do is you have a lot of power electronics around it to do some solid state switching, right? which you know, being solid state, they, there's not really a lifetime issue there. Right? So, you know, we do, we have tap changing transformers, but you know, just, they're just mechanical devices. Okay? So they're just something to remember. Okay? But so, you know, uh, setting, you know, finding the correct setting and when to switching them is actually quite a hard optimization problem. But in this class, you know, all we care about is, you know, we pick some setting and uh, we get a turn ratio. Okay, so for us, the analysis doesn't change because we'll just always be operating at it you know, some particular uh, arm, a particular tap of the transformer. Any questions about this? Okay, so this is, you know, all we'll say about a single phase transform. It's just, this, uh, the equations are simple for this, at least ideal transformer side, right? So it's more interesting if we talk about three phase transformers. Okay, so as we said, you know, all generators are three phase. So all transformers in practice are actually three phase transformers. And three phase transformers is interesting because so in principle, you can think of this just three phases. Each of them has a turn ratio n1 to n2. So they are symmetrical, there's n1 to n2. This is fine. You can put them into a three phase transformer, actually. So this is you know, literally how you construct a three phase transformer. But the interesting thing comes from that, remember for three phase circuits, Right? You don't have six wires coming in and out of it. Right? You only have three wires. Right? That's the point of using three phase. So we need to figure out what to do with this A prime, B prime, C prime. Right? So we're again here, the thing is, you know, is it in a Y connection? Do you tie the A prime, B prime, C prime all together? Think of that as a ground node. Or do you do a delta connection where you go from you know, A to B, B to A? So A to B, B to C, C to A. Okay, so the complication just comes from you know, how do you tie the two ends together? Okay, so is it Y to Y, delta to delta, or Y to delta? Okay, so tying them together, so there's again two uh, configurations, right? One is the YY or star star configuration. This is you tie the primes out to the same node. You can think of this as a ground node, as a common ground. So then your transform your transformer looks like a you know three transformers stacked together. Right? So you have a A phase. So yeah, so you have an A phase a B phase, a C phase. And so you have A to A, B to B, and C to C. Okay, you tie them all together. And you can think of, you know, and here the N1 to N2 are the same for each phase. 
the three-phase transformer in a star connection is just uh, think of three per phase transformer all connect together. And uh, the way you make it is very simple. You take all the prime uh, nodes, tie them all together. That creates your transform. And this way, the turns ratio is easy, right? So the turns ratio is this is equal to VBN. And one over N2. Okay, so the same turns ratio. And then if you look at the line to line, this is root three and one over N2. Any questions? Okay, and you can make this uh, Y to Y transformer just by using three single phase transformers, right? This is just how you tie the wires together. Okay. So the next you know, thing is delta to delta, right? So instead of I don't need to uh, tie them in a Y connection, I can tie them in a delta connection. Right? So similarly to Y to Y, you get that the line to line or the per phase voltage here is N1 over N2. Okay, and then the last one we care about is the Y to Delta, right? They don't have to be tied in the same fashion. You can tie them, uh, you know, we can have one side as Y, another side as Delta. So this is Y to Delta. And then this is slightly more interesting because you need to think about what is actually uh, the turns ratio referring to. Okay, so in this case, we have on the primary side is a line to neutral voltage, but on the secondary side, it's actually a line to line voltage that corresponds to, right? So you identify the windings, you identify the windings. On one side is a Y, on the other side is a delta. So this is the way it turns out to be. This is N1 over N2. Right. This depends on the physical number of windings you have. So this is a turns ratio. This turns ratio corresponding to per phase over line to line. So we may want to convert this from to a line to line turns ratio. Then there's a root three VAN. See, this is root three times N1 over N2. Okay. So that's simply, uh, you have a factor of root three sitting in front of it. Right, any questions with this? Okay, so this is again quite simple. So conceptually, all these are quite simple. It gets slightly more complicated when we talk about ratings for three-phase transformers. Okay, so three-phase transformers are all given this way. Okay, three-phase transformers are all given this way. You still have a power, right? So this is the total apparent power. Okay, so this is the three phase apparent power. Then what is this voltage then? This is the primary voltage, but what voltage is this referring to? Is this line to line or line to neutral? So think back to three phase. So when we talk about three phase, when you see a voltage show up, which voltage does it refer to? Line to line by default. Right, so this is line to line. So when you read a three phase transformer rating, this is primary voltage and this is line to line, regardless of connection. Okay, regardless of how this connected, this always reads as a line to line voltage. So this is secondary. This is also line to line. And this is also a line to line voltage. So this does not fully tell you what the transformer looks like because I still need to tell you the connection. 
Okay, so if you read the three phase transformers as the power rating, the voltage, the line to line voltage rating, and then one of the three, right? So this is either. So this can be Y, Y, delta, delta, or Y, delta. Okay, so the problem is to give you three, uh, one of the three choices. Okay, I'll give you that. So I'll always give you a total power. I always give you the line to line motor ratings, and then we'll tell you a configuration. This thing is you. Okay, tell you some configuration. This is you. Right, any question about this? Uh, the way the numbers are set. Okay, so if there's no questions. So we'll just run through you know some example of this. Right, so this is again, you know, you'll see one of this, a question like one of these examples in the final, right? Because three phase transformer calculations, if you go to a utility, you'll actually be doing a lot of this. Okay, so we spend a lot of time figuring out uh, the power ratings, the turns ratios for three phase transformers. Okay, so that we'll do, we'll do one example per connection. Okay, so here we have a 12 kVA transformer. Uh, 130, 13.8 kV to 416 YY. Okay, so this is the connection, right? This tell you, this is Y to Y, this is YY connection. And uh, these are the ratings. So let's say find the, let's find N1 over N2. And then let's find the rated current. Okay, so let's find these numbers. Okay. So for I1 over I, for, sorry, for N1 over N2, since this is YY, this is pretty simple, right? So this is VAN over VAN, this is U3. One over U3 VAB. 1 over root 3 VAB, but root 3 cancels anyway, so this is 15.8 kV for 16 volts. So you got a turns ratio of 33.17. Okay. So this is our uh, turns ratio, N1 over N2. Then for rate of current, well, remember what we have is we have the apparent power a uh, root three times the line to line voltage times say, let's say the uh, line current, right? So from this equation, we can compute the line current as 12 kVA root three times. So on the primary side, we have current rating of 0.5 amps. And on the secondary side, we have 12 kVA through 3, 4, 16, 16.65. 16 okay, so this is the uh, rating for this YY connected transformer. Any questions about this connection? Okay, so this is why we can do the same thing for delta delta. Okay, so let's, let's do the, let's just go through one example each for delta delta. So let's say this is our delta to delta transformer, right? So 15 kVA, 25 kV to 5 kV, delta delta. Let's say we still want to compute the same thing, right? Let's say we still want to compute the turns ratio. And let's find the rated current. So in this case, again, because the connection is nice, right? It's a delta delta connection, right? So this is uh, still a nice connection. And then this N1 over N2 is just 25 over five, right? So this has the ratio of five. And then the radial line current is again S over root three VAB. 
15 kVA, root 3 times 25 kV. So the primary rate of current is 0 0.346 amps. And then repeating the same calculation, you get the secondary rate of current is uh, just five times this, right? So, so basically just a uh, factor of five multiplying by this number. Okay, so this is a pretty simple calculation. If the y, if the connection are the same on both sides. So the little bit not trivial case is the Y to delta connection. Okay, so this is slightly more interesting from Y to delta connection. So let's say if I have Y on the primary side and delta on the secondary side. Okay, so now let's think of what is N1 over N2. Okay, so now let's think of what is the terms ratio for this connection. So if I have Y on one side, delta on the other side, how do I find N1 over N2? Any suggestions? You have a Y on this side, but you have a delta on this side. And I want the turns ratio from N1, right? N1 over N2. So what is, what is N1 over N2 equals to? Which voltage do you divide to get the turns ratio? But before we just divided the voltages, right? And uh, uh, the root three will cancel out automatically because the same connection. But then for this case, what happens here? Oh, can you guys see, see me right on the page? Is the screen froze? I think it might be frozen because I only see N1 over N2 and nothing else written. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, huh. All right, so at the end of the quarter, this iPad also given up on Zoom. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess let's take our break now. Then. We'll try to fix this during the break. So let's, uh, so this is a last, uh, this is sort of the last question we'll do for ideal three-phase transformers. But uh, uh, so let's just break now. So let's come back at uh, 3.35. We'll do this example, then we'll go on to non-ideal transformers. Right? What happens you know, when we have losses in the transformer? Let's break now and I will try to fix this iPad. Okay, right, so, uh, okay, so let's come back to this example. This sort of the, uh, for three phase, it comes down to this kind of non-trivial examples. Basically, if you stack them, you know, one side is Y, the other side is Delta. What is actually is the turns ratio for this? Okay, so, in this case, what's N1 over N2? What, what voltage does the primary side correspond to and what is the voltage on the secondary side? Right, so if the primary side is Y, okay, so then basically you have this, you have this thing, right? So this is N1 over N2. Now on the primary side, which voltage should we look at? For this one? Line to neutral. Line to neutral, right? Because this winding is a lot, is connecting to neutral, right? It's the way the Y connection works. So this is actually VAN over V. But on the delta side, you're basically looking at a line to line voltage. Okay, so the 10, Right, so VAN is VAB divided by root three, so 20 kV divided by root three. So thus we get 11.55 kV and N1 to N2 is 11.55 over 10. Okay, so you need to do this conversion, right? 
And uh, if you do this conversion, you get a winding of, of course, 1.1 butterfly. So that's uh, the turns ratio you have in y to delta. Okay. So the sort of the tricky question we can ask you about three phases, uh, just y to delta. So y, y to y and delta to delta are relatively straightforward. Right? Whereas the y to delta is where the root three guys, right? where the root three gets you. Okay. So pay attention to where you should divide by root three in this kind of three phase. Any questions for this calculation? Why would you have y to delta instead of just having the same connection on both sides? Oh, so it depends on the uh, what kind of grounding you have, right? So you may have, for example, a generator to one side, that'll be a naturally a y connection. But then the other side, you may not have easy access to grounding. So you make a delta. The three phase on the other side is a delta connection. The load is a delta connection. And a lot of times is you're making these three phase things out of the single phase transformers. So there's some flexibility on how you stack on, on how you make them. Another reason is at the secondary, you may want a higher voltage. Uh, you may want a higher voltage. But let's say, you know, you cannot, uh, you're limited by the number of windings you have. So you may want a delta connection on the secondary side. You may want to boost voltage. Got it, thank so, you. Yeah, so depending on the load and the generator, depending on which is on one side of the other, you may have one and delta connections. So this is the three-phase transformer. So the circuits get a bit more complicated, right? If we think of actual transformer instead of ideal transformer, All right? So again, the ideal transformer is ideal because we ignore three things. We ignore the losses here. So of course we have losses. There's voltage and the fields in the metal, right? So there's losses, we ignore all that. We assume this is infinite permeability. Basically, if you have a magnetic flux in a material, we assume that the material itself does not oppose this flux. Okay? Well, the material itself doesn't basically react to this. And we assume that all of this flux go through the windings, nothing is leaked. That's so obviously that's not true. Right? So the actual transformer is we need to add more things. Okay? So the way we add more things is we start with this ideal transformer model, and then we add things to either side, right, to both sides, to try to represent all these lost components. So we try to represent you know, what is not ideal about this. Basically, we add the inductors and resistance to this to represent a non-ideal transfer. Okay. So the first thing we can look at is the flux, right? So what flux means is think of the magnetic field going through a set of coils. Not all the field will go through the coil, right? Go through the coil, go through the material, gets the other coil. Not everything gets there. There'll be some field that just doesn't get to the other side. And there are some flux that doesn't get to the other side. So you lose some of your flux. Here. So if you're losing magnetic flux, then what is the circuit element that we should add? We want to model the fact that we're losing some magnetic energy, magnetic flux. Or the flux is not making it entirely to the other side. So this is a loss in flux, which element represents this? So the flux that doesn't make to the other side basically is stored. Right? You can think of that sort of stored in one of those coils. And what element stores flux? Inductor. Inductor, right? So the coil looks like an inductor. And it will act like an inductor because you know, this has, you know, wire co coils will always store some flux but because of their shape, right? So this is, comes out as two inductors. Okay, so we can think of, there are two inductors. So some reactive power or some uh, flux are stored in those two inductors. 
So you have ideal transformer in the middle. This is ideal. But we're going to model leakage through this x1 and x2. So this, you still have transformation O1 to N2. We have x1, x2. And the fact that you actually have coils, right, just because you have wires, there'll be always some resistance in the wires. Okay, so these are the resistive losses we have. So we have X1, X2, R1, and R2, right, because this is the copper loss we have. This is a loss on the line. This copper loss due to the resistance on the wires itself. So these are the two elements we have, but we still have more, we still have more. The reason we have some other elements is if you think about this flux, basically what happens is I'm taking a magnetic field. Right? I have a flux going around, let's say in this direction. What would the material do? What does the iron core try to do if you try to put a magnetic flux through it? What does the material do? How would the, let's say the, you know, electrons in this material react when you put a flux through this? So think back to physics, right? So you have this uh, uh, metal conductor, but it's not a perfect magnetic material. So now if I put some flexing in, how would the, let's say the charge carriers, the electrons react to this flux? Would that help the flux or the oppose the flux? Oppose the flux. Oppose the flux, right? So that's the natural reaction of the material, right? So if I put some flux through it, because of the point is mu is not infinite, right? It's not the, so this finite number mu means you have a current, you basically have a magnetizing current. Now try to oppose this flux. I try to say, okay, I don't like this flux going through my material. So I'm gonna to try to sort of counter this. I'll try to cancel this flux out. The charge carrier will try to move. And the way we model that is to say that some of the current gets diverted, right? Doesn't make it all the way through because it gets lost in a shunt reactance. It gets lost in a shunt reactance. This is called a magnetizing current. And this basically means that you have current flow in your core. Okay, the charge carriers in the core itself will try to form a current with the goal of canceling out your uh, flux. Okay, so this shows up as a loss element on the primary side, right? Not all the current from the primary side makes it secondary because some of this current is canceled out by a uh, magnetizing current inside the core itself. <coughs> and because this is a, you have current flow in the core, then you always have some loss. Right. Whenever we have a current flow, you have you know resistive loss associated with it. And so we have another loss element. This is called iron loss. And so now, so this picture is the full model. Okay. This is so-called the sort of full uh, transformer model. So if you look at this full, full model, okay. so this now has not the all the non-ideal elements in it, right? It has X1, X2, R1, R2, the shunt element R0 and X0. Okay, so have all these elements in it. And the thing is that if you look at the currents, right? If you look at the current and the voltages, what we have is E1 over E2. This is N1 over N2, right? Because they are across the ideal transformer. But if you look from input to output, this is not N1 over N2 anymore because we have a bunch of things in the middle. 
That's not a one over n two. But similarly, if you have the current, this i two prime current that goes into the ideal transformer over i two, this is n two over n one. But if you look at the input, this is not n two over n one. All right, any questions up to now? So next, our goal is to make the circuit simpler. Okay, so this is actually quite a complicated looking circuit. Has shunts in it, has uh, you know, a transformer in it, has things on both sides. So we're going to make this into a simpler circuit by basically reflecting whatever we have on the secondary side to the primary side. Okay, so we're gonna do a reflection. Basically, we don't want to analyze the transformer anymore. We don't want to deal with the ideal transformer anymore. So we're gonna write down a current and voltage equation and reflect all the impedance from the secondary side to the primary side. Okay, so this is E1, N1 over N2, E2. So this is always true, There's, this, this is true. So I can write this as N1 over N2. I can compute E2. This is I2, R plus JX2 plus V2. Okay. So this is still fine up to here, right? This is all fine. Any question with this equation? Okay. So this is fine. So now the idea is to replace this by I2 prime. Because I2 is on the right-hand side, so I want to replace this with something on the left-hand side to reflect impedance over and to reflect it to the primary side. So if I do this, right, if I replace this with I2 prime, right, the current, so you can think of this as the reflected current. What I need to do is I need to multiply things by N1 over N2 again to do this replacement. So this I can do, this I can always do. Now I'm gonna just collect terms. Okay, I'm gonna collect terms and make things simpler. The way you collect terms is this is I2 prime N1 over N2 squared R plus JX2 plus N1 over N2 V2. Okay. And we're gonna name names basically. We're gonna group this into one name. One, uh, we're going to basically uh, multiply n1 over n2 inside. We're going to multiply n1 over n2 inside to this v2. Okay. So we're going to just redefine some new numbers. We're going to redefine some new numbers. Then I get e1 as i2 prime r2 prime plus jx2 prime plus v2 prime. Right, so by pre-multiplying this n1 over n2 factor into all these numbers, the nice thing is after doing uh, this pre-multiplying, after doing this multiplication, after doing this reflection, I don't need to care the fact that I have a transformer anymore. Okay, I can get away, I can change from this model, which is complicated, to a much simpler model, which is the primary side doesn't change. So the primary side stays the same. But then the secondary side is replaced by R2 prime, X2 prime, and uh, V2 prime. Okay. So my goal is to replace the, uh, get rid of the transformer. Basically, the fact that I have a transformer with turns ratio n1 over n2 now becomes a, another circuit where I just change the values of r and x and v2. Any question with this? Uh, can you go back up a slide? Yeah. Uh, for that one, where is the n1 over n2 square and the n1 over n2 go for the final yes. conversion? So this is just coming redefining the number. So we're gonna call R2 prime this number. 
Okay, so wherever you have R2, I'm gonna write R2 prime. And this contains a factor of N1 over N2 square. Oh, I see. Thank right, so you. you com compare those two equations, right? This no prime, this is a prime equation. Right? So that's, uh, that's why I can, but then this equation just corresponds to the second circuit, right? to the bottom circuit, which is much simpler circuit. And the really the nice thing coming from this circuit is not so much, you know, why you get rid of this N1, N2 things, you just care about N2, X2 prime, R2 prime. Another thing is now we can make it even simpler, right? This circuit is still not trivial because it has a shunt. Yeah, right? This has a shunt. In it. So now let's think of this numbers we have, right? Let's think of this numbers. If you look at the number R0 versus R1, which is larger? Right, so the shunt, you compare the shunt values with the values that I say in series. Is R0 larger or R1 larger? R1 is larger. If R1 is larger, then we're in trouble by this circuit, right? Because most of the current will flow through R0. All right, so this is a, right? So shunt, remember, the shunt corresponds to the fact that, you know, I don't have a perfect uh, conducting core. So what this number typically, this R0 turns out to be very large, much larger than R1. And what this implies is this shunt is roughly an open circuit. Right, so for an open circuit, the impedance is infinity if you have open circuit. So this comes from that the core is not ideal. But this is, right, so the ideal core will have R0 be infinity, X0 be infinity. Okay, so a non-ideal core has some finite R0, but still some number that's much, much larger than the others we have. Okay. So this, is the, this number is much, much larger. So the current flow, this I0, is relatively small, or is much smaller compared to the other currents we have in this. OK? Right. And what this allows us to do is to simplify this much more. Because what we can do now is we can pull this element in front of it. And we can pull this element in front of the uh, all the elements in series, right? We can pull the shunt in front of it. But then this circuit looks really sort of much, much simpler because, so these are my shunt elements. But now I can add the elements as in series to each other. Right, I can add them up now. I have V1 on this side, but V1 also show up here. Show up here. So the current calculation is much simpler if I make the circuit this way. Okay, I have a much, much simpler current calculation. Any questions with this simplification? Okay, so the current is much simpler to compute because I don't need to worry about the shunt and do the voltage divider and all this kind of thing. I just pull in front. And in practice, what we really you know, do most of the time is gonna ignore the shunt altogether. Okay, I'm gonna say the core is designed you know, fairly well. So let's just ignore the whole thing then we can define the equivalent resistance, the equivalent reactance, and get a really simple model. Okay, get a sort of a trivially, uh, not trivially, but uh, you know, a model that's really, really easy to work with. 
So this becomes a simple circuit with some load, right, Z prime, and uh, with some, you know, source equivalent react. So this, then this equivalent resistance and reactance characterize the non-idealities and the turns ratios in our transformer. So very often in practice, you'll be just looking at this model, right? But then to know where this model comes from as one, uh, sort of building the number, the ratio n1 over n2 into this, into the, you know, REQ, XEQ, builds into it. And then the other fact is, it uh, sort of ignores the shunt part of the non -ID of the actual transformer. Because that shunt is normally doesn't impact our calculation by much. It only makes a sort of 1% difference at the end of the day. It makes the equation a lot more complicated. So often we just ignore that, okay? But one thing just to know about the notations is of course, right? So we have a lot of primes. So it's important to remember what the primes are. Right, so if you see a prime on voltage or current, you have a factor of N1 over N2 somewhere. You have a prime on the impedance, then you have a factor of N1 over N2 square. All right. Any questions with this? Okay, so this notation, and of course, so the idea of a simplified model is that if given Z, if you want to use the complete model to find V1, that's very difficult. Okay, so using the complete model to find V1 is very, very challenging. But if you use a simplified model, then things become much simpler. Okay, so we're going to simplify model means uh, neglect or ignore R0, X0. So assume that this is open, the shunt is not there, it's open circuit. And then the calculation, right? Then sort of this becomes much simpler to work with. This becomes much simpler to work with, right? Because this circuit just becomes this with a load, V1, V2, prime, REQ, XEQ. Okay. So this becomes a much, much simpler circuit we'll have to look at. And uh, you can directly figure out, you can directly relate. Right. And then for this circuit, you can easily relate the voltage and current to each other. Right. So for example, here we have V1, this is V2 prime plus I2 prime. Q plus J X C T. So this makes our, our calculations much simpler than before. Okay, any questions? You said the, the shun is only make a difference by 1%. So that shun is included in the, the system, right? It's not like the resistance that we add on, right? Yeah, so the shunt is internal to the transformer, right? It comes from the fact that you don't have a perfect core, right? You have some current flow in your core. Right? So the shunt is, is not external. It doesn't come from the load. It's a fact that you're, you don't have per transformer, it's not perfect. But that being said, the tra our transformers are you know, close to being perfect. They're very close. So the shunt values are typically, you know, super large. So for example, right? So let's, let's look at them. We, normally this is typical numbers, right? You have an equivalent resistance that's one ohm, equivalent reactance that's 10 ohms, and then shunt is, you know, a thousand ohms for X0, 5,000 ohms for, a thousand ohms for R0, 5,000 ohms for X0. Okay. So you can put them in. But having a 1,000 plus J5,000 shunt impedance is almost the same as having that being open. Okay, it's almost having, you know, having them not there. Okay. 
So the idea is, is you know, Shonda is there in practice, but the value is such that you can safely ignore them, right? You can safely not care. Uh, not when you're doing computation, not care about what this is. All right, so let's do this example. Let's finish this example, right? So here I was basically saying that I give you a transformer, I give you the voltage on the primary side, right? V1 is thousand volts. Figure out the load voltage. So this is V2 if the, your load is 0.5 angle 30 degrees. So here R0 is much, much larger than everything else. X0 is much, much larger than everything else. So we're gonna ignore the shunt, ignore the R0, X0. So we're only gonna use this simple circuit. <laughs> Our circuit will be very easy. And for this circuit, all we need to do is to compute the prime quantities. Right? So remember to use this equivalent circuit, uh, we need to go from the, the low to the L prime. So this is, so turns ratio of 10, so this is 0.5 angle 30 degrees, 10 squared, 50 angle 30 degrees. Then what we can do is I2 prime, we one over R equivalent plus JX equivalent plus the load, right? Everything is in series. Plug things in, you got 17.7 .7 and go minus 38.31. Amps. Okay. So we know the current, then we know what V2 prime is. Right? We know what V2 prime is. This is I2 prime, the L prime, we get 885 angle minus degrees volts. So the question says compute the low voltage, this is V2. So we need to change from V2 prime to V2. So V2 is V2 prime and two over N1. Right, so this is 885 angle minus one over 10, so 88.5. Okay, so this is uh, the transformer calculations. Right, any questions about this calculation? Uh, can you go back up a little bit? Okay, okay thank you. Okay, so this sort of another typical example of transformer calculation. Right? So uh, with this, I think we'll skip voltage regulation. So we'll skip voltage regulation. So we'll end the transformer section here, right? This is the, so all it is, is basically, those are two things that can be potentially tricky with transformers. One is in three phase transformers, you forgot multiply by root three somewhere. You forgot the root three factor. Second is for this kind of questions, you got confused on know where the factor of N1 over N2 should go, right? So you'll see a lot of, right? So uh, in the next homework, you'll see a lot of examples with this. And also, you know, look at this table, right? We have a table of finding the right turns ratios. So for the kind of question, you know, think carefully where the root three goes, think carefully what the ratio you multiply things by. And otherwise the circuit are quite simple, right? Well, Almost always ignore the shunt elements and uh, then all the calculations come up to be very simple if you can get the ratio correct, okay? All right, okay, so then we have one, so next Monday is the holiday, so we have one class left. So that class will do induction motors, which basically is a circuit with a transformer, it's a machine with a transformer inside of it, okay? All right, so, and, uh, so I'll see you next uh, Wednesday.